Thank you. We also want to thank the community for their participation so far in this study. Without your feedback, insights, and work to support the study, especially through a pandemic, we would not have been in a position to, be, to bring you this work tonight. We especially want to thank members of the Stakeholder Advisory Committee who have been an essential resource in providing feedback, helping to shape the plans before you this evening, and doing research in support of the community tree inventory. We would like to acknowledge them this evening, and they are Councillor Reg Frake, Councillor Kevin Ritchie, Kate Sherrill, Bruce and Lori McKenzie, Terry McDonald, Haley Pankhurst, Mark Raddy, Heather Bennett Ch Chamberlain, Bob Friesen, Mark Grammetre, Kelly Callback, Barbara McKay, and Susan Pierce. A sincere thank you on our behalf. Tonight is an opportunity for the community to better understand and ask questions about the results of the study prior to our more formal public meeting scheduled for November 4th at 7 p.m. There will also be an open house just prior to the public meeting on the 4th to learn and ask questions, and that will happen at 6 p.m. Before Dana begins the presentation deck to outline the planning study, the draft secondary plan, the draft zoning bylaw amendment, and other materials, we wanted to provide some context for the study. Following the presentation, there will be an opportunity for questions. This study and the resulting draft secondary plan and zoning are the result of many engagement sessions with the community and have been reviewed by both the stakeholder and technical advisory committees prior to presenting them to the larger community. As the presentation will demonstrate, many issues and concerns were addressed throughout the study, looking at potential growth and change in the area, servicing, including transportation and parking, and the importance of many features in the community, such as cultural heritage, parks, views, and vistas. At the request of the community, the area is slightly expanded from the original study area proposal, extends UW along Grand Avenue to include tree stand. The proposed secondary plan for the area is different from other secondary plans in the town, as it is focused on limited growth and change in the area that consider and respect the existing cultural heritage. The intent is to strengthen and enhance policy in the official plan that better consider the heritage and uniqueness of the Grimsby Beach area, while also considering other issues such as transportation, trees, servicing, and parking. The presentation indicates that final drafts will be going to council in December. We would like to clarify that this is the soonest they would go to council and that the comments provided tonight in the and in the open house and public meeting next week will all be considered in the final version going to council. And that it's my pleasure to both thank and turn it over to MHBC uh, Dan Anderson. Thanks, Dana. Thank you so much, Antonetta, and I apologize. I know a few hands went up. I think there were a few points, Antonetta, where you were breaking up just a little bit, um, but hopefully the presentation will cover any of, of the areas that might have, have been broken up. Um, but thank you for that, and thank you again for everyone for attending uh, this evening. Again, my name is Dana Anderson. I'm a planner with MHBC Planning. Um, and we're here tonight to provide an overview, um, as Antonetta indicated, of the study process and also some of the key documents in draft in terms of the secondary plan, the zoning bylaw, and some of the um, proposed implementation plans and guidelines. And so we wanted to provide that overview through a brief presentation, uh, which will also be available um, after tonight's webinar on the town's uh, webpage and also uh, give us an opportunity to open it up to questions as well as comments in the chat. And once we get to that part of the presentation or the webinar tonight, we'll talk to the best ways that you can do that if you're joining us uh, through your phone or uh, through your uh, laptop. Um, so with that, I'll pass it over um, to Bianca, who's going to share the presentation. It's uh, just under about 20 minutes, and at the end, we'll open it up for questions. So thank you so much, everyone, and I'll hand it over to share uh, through Bianca.
following webinar presentation is focused on the recently completed Grimsby Beach planning report and recommended secondary plan zoning bylaw amendment and supporting implementation materials. A copy of the draft planning report, secondary plan and zoning bylaw, as well as the draft tree strategy, urban design and heritage guidelines, and the draft infrastructure plan and fiscal impact assessment are all available on the Let's Talk Grimsby website for the Grimsby Beach study. The following presentation will also be available for review and reference on the website page. This presentation will provide an overview of the work that has been completed to date and present an overview of the draft planning report, the draft secondary plan, the draft zoning bylaw amendment, draft infrastructure plan and fiscal impact assessment, the draft tree strategy, and the draft urban design and heritage guidelines. At the end of the presentation, next steps will be provided for the study. The following slide provides an update on the study's work program. The study was commenced last fall with a project launch and walking tours within the community and a series of meetings with the Technical Advisory Committee as well as the Stakeholder Advisory Committee. These meetings provided an opportunity to present information and get feedback from the community. In Phase 1, a detailed background and key findings report was completed. In Phase 2, the focus on, was on developing a vision and objectives for Grimsby Beach. Different approaches and tools that are available to address planning in Grimsby Beach were presented to the community through online engagement and through a series of surveys. All of the feedback was taken into account through these early phases and a draft secondary plan and implementing zoning bylaw was chosen as the preferred and best approach to address land use in Grimsby Beach. The evaluation also provided recommendations towards infrastructure, servicing, urban design and heritage to support the policies and regulations set out in the secondary plan and zoning bylaw. At the current stage, we have met with the Technical Advisory Committee and Stakeholder Advisory Committee and made revisions to the reports based on initial feedback. The reports, now finalized in draft, are available for review and comment by the public and will be presented to Council through the formal Planning Act process with a public meeting on November 4th. Finally, a recommendation report with the final versions of the Secondary Plan and Zoning Bylaw will proceed to Council in December. In terms of the study area, it should be noted that early in the process, the study boundary was expanded to incorporate additional areas as noted by the community that should be provided as part of Grimsby Beach. The following map shows the boundary of the Grimsby Beach secondary plan area with the expanded areas. The study area is generally bound by Lake Ontario to the north, Baker Road north to the west, Park Road north to the east, and the QEW to the south. I'd like to provide a brief overview of the draft reports and plans which have now been completed as part of phase three of the study. First is the draft planning report. It is a more detailed document that sets out an assessment of the planning approaches and planning tools from the previous phase and provides recommendations for a preferred approach to planning in Grimsby Beach. Within this report is an overview summary of how each approach was evaluated. The planning report recommends the following tools for Grimsby Beach. A secondary plan that should be prepared, which will provide goals, objectives, and policies specific to the unique natural and cultural heritage character of the area. An update to the zoning bylaw, which is needed to implement the policies of the secondary plan. Urban design and heritage guidelines which should be completed to provide further urban design direction that reflects the unique characteristics of Grimsby Beach. And finally, a tree strategy, which should be prepared to address tree protection and tree enhancement within the area. 
What is also set out in the planning report are details of the secondary plan, which address many of the issues that were raised through the study process. These included issues related to land use, growth management, cultural heritage and urban design, the character of Grimsby Beach, servicing, transportation, parking, natural heritage and preservation, as well as tree protection. Different components of the secondary plan address the key issues that were raised through new policies. In terms of land use, it is recommended that the existing land use designations and policies provided in the town's official plan be retained for Grimsby Beach. The secondary plan refers back to these designations and policies and also adds new policies which intend to maintain the environmental protection area and hazard designation along the shoreline. The secondary plan also includes new general policies. In this section of the secondary plan, the general policies include policies for growth management. The growth management policies describe the limited growth within the Grimsby Beach area that is in, expected to occur through minor infill development consisting of new units on vacant lots as well as lot severances which will be required to be undertaken in accordance with the new character policies for the area. Additional growth may also occur through the addition of secondary suites. The projected growth is further assessed through the draft infrastructure plan that sets out improvements that are required to accommodate change and growth within the Grimsby Beach area. The planning report also speaks to cultural heritage. A number of recommendations in the report include new policies and new guidelines for heritage. It is also recommended that the town continue to list and designate properties under Part 4 of the Heritage Act. The report recognizes three character areas for Grimsby Beach. These include the core, the south, and the northwest areas. The report identifies key views, vistas, and gateways within these areas which are identified and have respective policies for design and cultural heritage protection. For urban design, the secondary plan has added new urban design policies unique to Grimsby Beach, which are set out in the plan and the accompanying design guidelines that are specific to the public and private realm in each of the character areas. These guidelines support where and how change and development may occur. This also includes improvements or enhancements in some of the existing public realm areas. As noted earlier, the three character areas that have been defined for Grimsby Beach include the core area, the south area, and the northwest area. These areas were defined on the basis of the historical lotting, key features, and context for each area. The planning report provides a section that identifies these areas, providing a description of each, as well as additional policies that are recommended related to land use, urban design, and heritage, as well as implementation. In terms of servicing, the planning report provides a detailed assessment by Crozier Engineering related to both servicing and transportation, and includes new policies proposed related to future development and servicing. A draft infrastructure plan has also been prepared, which identifies proposed improvements for servicing for existing development and future development. Policies are also included and recommended to address sediment and erosion control for development along the shoreline. In terms of transportation, the secondary plan sets out the transportation network for Grimsby Beach. This is not exclusive to the road network as it also includes active transportation routes, including pedestrian routes, cycling lanes, and pedestrian connections, which are all supported by enhanced policies within the secondary plan. The transportation section of the report also includes recommendations 
for new signage for both the street network and for parking areas. In terms of parks and open space, there are recommendations for a public realm master plan to be prepared to address the public area delineations and connections throughout Grimsby Beach. This matter was raised throughout the public consultation and should identify areas that are publicly owned and identify how those areas can be enhanced. In terms of natural heritage, it is recommended that the current land use designations and key features be maintained, which include the environmental conservation areas and hazard areas as designated within Grimsby Beach today. Additional policies are also recommended to address erosion control and shoreline protection. In terms of tree canopies and tree protection, new policies are added to ensure that tree canopies are protected and enhanced. Recommendations for a number of programs and strategies, which include a tree management plan or urban forest management plan, are also described in the report. Policies related to implementation tools and requirements are also set out in the secondary plan and described in the planning report. These tools include requirements for site plans, as well as additional policies for lot severances and criteria for development applications. It is also recommended that the town bring forward a deeming bylaw, which could be used to remove lands from older draft plans of subdivision. Other tools and supporting documents include the Urban Design and Heritage Guidelines, as well as the Draft Infrastructure Plan and the Tree Strategy, all of which are described in detail in the planning report. A copy of the Draft Secondary Plan is appended to the planning report. The draft secondary plan includes goals and objectives, as well as a series of general policies and specific policies related to Grimsby Beach. The plan sets out the goals and objectives that were developed through the community engagement process as part of the study. The goal within Grimsby Beach is to guide change that maintains and enhances the unique character of the area while protecting and conserving the natural and cultural heritage features and the existing built form of the area, including the shoreline, trees, open spaces, and parks. The specific objectives are pulled from the goal for Grimsby Beach and include maintaining and conserving the character of Grimsby Beach and its uniqueness, protecting the shoreline and the natural and environmental features of the area, protecting and replenishing trees and canopy cover, maintaining and enhancing parks, open space areas and connections, and identifying and conserving significant cultural heritage resources. As previously noted, the secondary plan includes general policies, which include policies for land uses and designations, specific policies relating to the new character areas, policies for growth management that identifies how growth will occur to 2051, as well as additional policies for servicing and transportation within Grimsby Beach. Additional general policies are all also provided for natural heritage, tree protection, parks, open spaces and trails, as well as general policies related to cultural heritage and urban design. Finally, given the importance of the unique natural and cultural heritage character of Grimsby Beach, the draft secondary plan includes additional implementation policies for planning processes and approvals. Development applications are to address the urban design and heritage design guidelines for Grimsby Beach, as well as development application criteria. Additional policies for zoning and site plan control have also been added to the plan and specific policies are set out that address lot creation and the development of vacant lots. The following map or schedule to the secondary plan shows the area that establishes the Grimsby Beach secondary plan area.
an additional schedule sets out the land use designations that apply to Grimsby Beach. Many of these designations are carried forward from the Town of Grimsby official plan and include the low density residential area, parks and open space area, environmental conservation area, as well as the hazard lands along the shoreline. The three character areas within Grimsby Beach are set out and identified on Schedule L1 to the new secondary plan. Again, these include the core area, the northwest area, and the south area. Finally, Schedule 2 to the secondary plan identifies the key views and vistas as well as gateways. These are also referenced in the policies and the urban design and cultural heritage guidelines for Grimsby Beach. A draft zoning bylaw amendment has also been prepared with the secondary plan. The zoning for the area in the core area of Grimsby Beach will largely remain within the Grimsby Beach zone. The Grimsby Beach zone includes provisions that in essence retain the legacy zoning for the area, permitting the existing lots and existing development and requiring further approvals for changes as are set out in the existing zoning provisions. Zone is recommended for the south and northwest areas of Grimsby Beach, which would be referenced as the Grimsby Beach One Zone. The Grimsby Beach One Zone includes provisions similar to those provisions that apply to the communities to the west of Grimsby Beach along the shoreline. The Grimsby Beach 1 zone is more reflective of the existing lot areas and frontages in both the northwest and south areas. Draft infrastructure plan and scoped fiscal impact assessment have also been provided to support the study of the Grimsby Beach area. The infrastructure plan provides the details on the Grimsby Beach servicing. It speaks to existing water mains, sanitary sewers, and the requirements for new development in the area. The scoped fiscal impact assessment looks specifically at the costs of providing for and supporting future development in the area over the next 30 years. Addressed tree strategy has been prepared, which sets out the importance of trees, the unique features of Grimsby Beach, and reflects on the input received from the community and information from the background report, which includes the natural heritage evaluation and tree inventory, as well as additional work and tree inventories prepared by the community. The draft tree strategy notes that there are a range of approaches and ways in which trees can be protected and enhanced within the community. Some of these activities may be carried out within the town's broader programs while also considering the costs and resources needed to implement such programs within the local area. The strategy also sets out what may be considered in terms of policies and guidelines which have been included in the draft secondary plan and urban design and heritage guidelines. The elements to be included in an urban forest or tree management plan and a range of examples of tree protection bylaws and community tree programs that have been successful in other municipalities. Finally, the draft urban design and heritage guidelines prepared for Grimsby Beach provide direction and guidance for development within the public and the private realm. The guidelines include visual information to assist with particular elements of design in both areas, including for the public realm, streetscapes, parking areas, landscaping, and the protection of views, vistas, and gateways. In terms of private development, the guidelines provide guidance related to the conservation of cultural heritage properties, guidelines for new development and replacement housing, and additional architectural guidelines that address a number of specific architectural and design requirements. All of the draft documents discussed during this webinar are available for review and comment on the Let's Talk Grimsby webpage for the Grimsby Beach study. 
The next steps for the project include a statutory public meeting, which will be held on November the 4th and will focus on the draft secondary plan and zoning bylaw. There will also be an opportunity to receive further comments through the public process prior to Council's consideration of those documents on December the 6th. We thank you for attending this webinar session today and we welcome your comments and questions. So oh, thank you, everyone. Um, my apologies. I know some of you had indicated that the volume was of, of issue at some parts during the presentation. And um, as mentioned, uh, we can go through any of, of the areas that may not have been as, as clear. And certainly a copy of the recording um, will be available online. I apologize for the technical issue there. Um, what I would like to do now is um, just share a slide with some questions we have received um, through some of the um, initial review of materials as they've been made available online. And I know these may cover some of the questions you have. And just a reminder that the uh, question and answer um, is available at the bottom of uh, the Zoom. And so you can type in any questions there. We'll be, staff are monitoring those and we'll be answering those, those live and also responding to them. And again, as Antonetta mentioned, taking all of those comments and questions uh, into consideration as we go to the next uh, part of the study process. And also any additional comments you may have, uh, please feel free to provide those into the chat. If you would like to ask a question live, please use uh, the raise hand function. And if you're calling in, I think it's star nine on your phone and we can open that up for you to be able to um, ask a question live. So with that, I'm just going to, um, I guess, share my screen with this additional slide that I have. And hopefully everyone can see that. And so I'll just start, um, perhaps I'll um, go through these and, and staff can jump in and, and answer and add to these uh, responses. Um, the first question we received stated that during the study, trees have been a significant focus in terms of uh, protection and the need to enhance the tree canopy. Can you reiterate how those issues have been addressed in the study and in the recommendations? And I would absolutely agree that trees, tree canopy, tree protection, uh, the replacement of trees, whether that's through uh, removal or through disease or uh, requirement for, for dead trees to be uh, removed and replaced, certainly was a key focus, as well as the importance of trees as they um, reflect the unique character of Grimsby Beach. And so uh, those elements of trees and tree protection have been addressed in, in a number of different ways uh, through the study. Um, in the secondary plan itself, there are actually specific um, objectives and, and uh, actual policies that are related to tree protection and tree canopy enhancement. Um, the secondary plan recommends that the town prepare a tree management plan, and that's also reflected um, in the tree strategy. The draft tree strategy um, provides for a full range of options for programs and approaches to address trees within Grimsby Beach, and also programs uh, that might be considered by the town on a town-wide basis with some specific um, uh, management plans and provisions for Grimsby Beach. And I did want to emphasize uh, the incredible work done by a number um, of members of the community, including some on our stakeholder advisory committee who provided uh, invaluable input into, um, into that process. And finally, the urban design and heritage design guidelines specifically address trees, uh, both in the public realm and on private property. And so there's a number of directions and guidance through that document um, that would apply to all of Grimsby Beach. Um, the second question is in relation to cultural heritage. And certainly this was at the focus um, of the study in terms of heritage and ways in which to address heritage through the process. 
And the question is, Grimsby Beach's cultural heritage importance has been the subject of past studies and considerations. And how does the new secondary plan ensure cultural heritage is being conserved? Um, and there were a number of, of comments and questions in relation to heritage uh, throughout uh, the study process. We certainly heard that through the walking tour and then comments on the draft documents um, and also very much a focus of, of the vision and objectives in the plan. So the secondary plan does provide for cultural heritage uh, first and foremost through the key vision and, and the objectives for the plan and then carries through in a number of policies um, in the secondary plan to ensure that cultural heritage resources are protected and enhanced uh, in Grimsby Beach. Um, the secondary plan clearly identifies the importance of cultural heritage attributes and the character of the areas, and it also uh, defines each of those areas as character areas as part of the planning framework. In addition, the design and heritage guidelines contain guidance on heritage uh, resources uh, that allow for an approach to follow uh, and, and reflect the unique design features uh, that are uh, that are identified in in many of the character areas. Um, the one thing to note is that the heritage policies and guidelines are not intended to be overly prescriptive or restrictive. They certainly reflect the uniqueness of the area and are not intended to provide a one size fits all approach to the area. And the guidelines also um, speak specifically, as I noted, to heritage features. And the approach that was taken in terms of cultural heritage. Um, did look at a number of approaches, including those under the provincial policy statement, um, the um, uh, Ontario Heritage Act in terms of listing and designating properties, both as what's referred to as part four and part five. And certainly there's nothing to preclude the continuation um, of those forms of, of designations and protection as the town is also um, updating its cultural heritage master plan. And certainly that's an ongoing um, consideration uh, for the core area. Um, the third question was to open space, sorry, the open space areas, shoreline and parks need to be better defined and connected. Um, this issue, uh, the issue of ensuring accessibility for open space was raised early in the process. And how is this being addressed? Um, that's an excellent question. And certainly at the beginning of the process, the issue around the connection of open space and what is public and private realm uh, was very important. And, and we have identified in the plan um, carrying forward uh, the open space and parks designation um, on the lands uh, that are currently designated within the beach that continues. The secondary plan adds a number of policies uh, related to public open spaces and parks and talks about the development. And this is quite important of a public realm master plan. And it's through that plan uh, that the identified areas uh, for public access uh, would be um, refined and, and reinforced. And also uh, the urban design and heritage guidelines speak specifically to both um, enhancements of public spaces um, and a number of improvements to the existing park areas. Um, probably one of the most, um, I guess, expressed concerns within Grimsby Beach relates to the next question. And that is um, specifically speaking to parking. Um, and this question stated that parking by far, uh, one of the most critical issues we face as residents, it's not working. How did the study address this and what is being done to fix it? Um, and I would say that parking is somewhat complex. There's certainly ways in which we can address uh, parking to some extent through land use. And we've tried to do that in the report, we identify how parking was assessed in terms of recommendations on the parking areas and, and new signage uh, for both the parking areas and the streets. And that is somewhat related to um, the issues that were raised with respect to parking and, and visitors to the area through tourism. Um, in the appendices to the um, secondary plan, there's, uh, sorry, the planning report, there's also reference to a number of specific um, parking signs that would direct people to uh, additional areas for, for parking, offsite parking. Um, and the town also undertook some separate review of this with members of the community, uh, which align with many of those uh, recommendations for parking. 
Um, and the planning report also recommends considerations for those additional parking areas. And the uh, design and heritage guidelines speak to um, how best to identify and provide for uh, those areas. Uh, finally, the last question we received prior to the webinar was maintaining and protecting the character of Grimsby Beach was to be the focus of the study. How is that um, being achieved through the new secondary plan and the zoning bylaw and the guidelines that are proposed? Um, and I would note that certainly the, the scale and the character and the design of the area was uh, very important as we heard through early engagement. Um, the scale and height of, of any change um, and development in the area is addressed through the secondary plan policies and the character areas for each of those policies, as well as through the um, urban design and heritage guideline document. Um, the planning report um, and the new zoning bylaw does reflect maintaining uh, the Grimsby Beach zone and also adds to that by specifying um, some additional provisions for existing vacant lots. And those vacant lots are also identified as, as part of the overall consideration for growth and change with um, new infill housing and specific policies to address that and policies to address applications uh, for development are set out in the secondary plan. And also the um, zoning for the South and the Northwest areas is introduced with a new zone to reflect the existing um, characteristics of those lot areas um, and uh, development within the area to be consistent with the characteristics for those areas to protect and maintain uh, development in those areas as well. So those are the sort of initial questions just to kind of kick us off. So with that, I hope um, many on the call may have, uh, we may have responded to some of your questions that you sent in earlier and we appreciate and thank you for that. So with that, maybe I'll open it up um, to uh, the Q&A area and maybe if anyone wants to um, uh, open it up live to questions, just feel free to uh, raise your hand. So I see in the chat um, a question, is it mandatory for a heritage impact assessment to be done if any heritage cottage listed either on the municipal registry or designated under part four of the Ontario uh, Heritage Act is in danger of demolition. It's not clear because in some areas the documents say it may be required and others it says um, it will be required, which is correct. So that's an excellent question. Um, we were discussing that there are uh, some areas where um, based on if it is a uh, designated or listed property, the requirement is that it would be required. But again, there are some exceptions to that based on the type of application. It would require a permit in some cases. And so that's something that um, depending on the nature of the application, uh, the heritage impact assessment um, may or may not be required. A, a good example would be uh, perhaps it's not uh, considered development. It would be considered as um, uh, replacement windows, for example, and would that require a heritage impact assessment? Uh, it may not. And, and so there is some discretion there based on the context. So we have noted that we will go back and look at um, the language as it relates to the heritage impact assessment requirements and make sure there is consistency for the um, uh, removing that discretion as, as it may exist uh, in uh, the secondary plan. So thank you uh, for that. Um, the next question, um, so maybe I'll just go to, uh, I think there's a question here. In the design guideline plan, it speaks to limiting parking on individual lots, especially wide lots, given the lack of public transportation. This is an issue and goes against the issue of needed parking. Um, that's um, uh, a good question. The issue of parking has, has come up in terms of parking requirements. Um, there are standard requirements in, in the bylaw uh, that would require a minimum size of a parking space and a minimum, minimum number of parking spaces uh, for a, a single detached dwelling. And so um, the design guideline is really speaking to um, the reference to limited parking as it exists on the smaller lots. 
Um, it's not intended to advocate for <laughs> sort of more parking. Um, and we wanted to make sure that that's reflected certainly um, by maintaining the, the legacy zoning as well. Um, there's a question about, concerned about the setbacks which are in the new bylaw as well as lot coverage. I don't believe that these are consistent with the area um, around, even if you separate Grimsby Beach and Grimsby Beach one, it doesn't fit with most of the existing houses in the area, please. Oops, sorry, I just lost that question. <laughs> oh. Can you um, see it now, Dana? I can, thank you. Okay. Um, sorry, uh, I just lost myself there. Sorry, one moment. Um, Yes, it says it doesn't fit with most of the existing houses in these areas. Please let me know how and why you came up with these new rules. Um, so I can certainly speak to that. Um, the the uh, the zoning for the areas the south and the northwest uh, were based on looking at the uh, development of those areas, the lot areas and lot frontages, and ensuring that the majority of those existing lots fit within uh, the new zoning that is being proposed. Certainly if an existing home um, has a, a setback or um, it could be a, a coverage uh, that is not fitting within that zone, it does not lose its status. In fact, it would maintain that. Um, what we were trying to do is, is avoid situations um, where that would allow for um, additional or, or larger um, homes in the area um, that were not reflective of, of the character. So certainly work was done and this is outlined in the planning report. It sets out a summary of uh, the development in those areas and the uh, particular zones within which uh, those areas could fit uh, to best reflect the characteristics of, of those areas. In terms of the core area, we actually haven't changed anything. We've maintained what we've referenced as the legacy zoning to ensure uh, that development is reflective of the existing houses in those, in those areas. Um, so sorry, there is a question. An anonymous attendee is asking, a number of residents in Grimsby Beach are asking why a heritage conservation district noted in the background report was not recommended in the planning report. Um, so I spoke to that briefly in, looking at the various approaches and noting um, that um, it's not specifically, it may not have been specifically recommended in the planning report, uh, but I believe there is a reference in the planning report to that being something that can continue to be considered. And so I don't think we're in any way precluding it. It isn't one of the implementing documents at this stage. And that's a result of the input and feedback we got uh, through the study and early in the study. Um, that set out the various approaches and the responses on the Heritage Conservation District were that there are a number of ways in which they can be implemented. Uh, but we did receive feedback that that was seen as um, a more prescriptive approach and was actually from our survey results, not something um, that was um, one of the key approaches or only approaches to be considered. So we used multiple approaches in terms of the planning framework we put forward. And again, it's not to say that the a Heritage Conservation District could not be uh, also implemented uh, for the core area or all of the area, but mostly for specifically for the core area. And that is identified um, in the planning in the planning report. Um, I don't know if staff, there's a question here about parking um, and satellite parking. Is that something perhaps from, I believe it's from Bruce. Is that something maybe staff could respond to? The question, um, a resolution on tourist parking and use of satellite parking. And I can jump in and say, I don't know if that's specifically been looked at. I know our director of parks, recreation and culture as, re as well as our um, director of public works, we're looking into a series of ways to deal with this. And I know that a separate survey and some other on these types of issues was also conducted by that team. So we can circle back with them and provide this comment to them to see if they have considered this and what other things they 
they can consider. So happy to take that back to that team. That's great. Thanks, Antonetta. Um, another question is now that the draft report is done and the consultants recommendations for Heritage Conservation District, which appeared in the background report is nowhere to be found. Can you clarify? I think I know, I think that was similar to the earlier question. Um, and again, I think this question relates um, to, again, not the preclusion of doing a heritage conservation district, uh, but it not being a plan that was developed at, at this point in time. But again, it's not precluded from, from going forward. It's something staff have noted and that they can consider as, as part of um, the implementation. Um, the next question comes, actually, this is from Anonymous as well. Um, why did the study not address the issue of land allowance alongside the Victoria Terrace Park, where steady encroachment of the gardens into the park area ended with the town granting an easement to the home? So that's an excellent question, and it's certainly something that we identified, as I mentioned earlier, and it's something that we um, have noted needs to be considered through what we've referred to as the public realm plan. And there are a number of uh, public areas, there are a number of easements and um, encroachments throughout the Grimsby Beach area, which um, we have recommended need to be confirmed through that process. And so I think um, much of the considerations along Victoria Terrace and some other areas will be addressed uh, through that plan. So there's a, a very defined delineation between uh, the public and the private realm, and also um, will help in terms of enhancing uh, connectivity through those through those areas and addressing some of those um, some of those concerns. Um, uh, there's a question again about parking. Thanks, Kate. Uh, note since parking was a significant concern in the core area with residents having limited places to park on private properties, public exacerbated by increased tourism. Why are we considering adding secondary suites in the core area? Um, yes, there is a need for affordable housing, but it's historic Grimsby Beach core, the best place to intensify. So I can certainly answer that and perhaps staff can add to that. Um, while uh, secondary suites um, are being considered throughout Grimsby Beach, um, it's also a function of what is uh, required in terms of secondary suites being something um, that are required by provincial policy um, to be provided throughout municipalities as of right. Now, that gives municipalities uh, the ability to control secondary suites through appropriate zoning provisions, which would include um, certain requirements for um, the size of those units, um, certain requirements for additional parking. And so if someone, for instance, was looking to accommodate a secondary suite, we clearly noted in uh, the report that not all lots um, or areas would be able to accommodate those secondary suites based on the current uh, regulations. And so someone could seek to amend those or change those, but we note that there is a reality um, to providing for that additional suite um, with those added regulations and requirements. So again, we're implementing to some extent um, the opportunity to consider secondary suites as part of balancing some additional growth and change, noting that not all areas would be able to, to accommodate those requirements as they're already set out in the town zoning zoning bylaw. So again, it's a, it's a question of, of balancing and the appropriate level of uh, change given the historic um, uniqueness of, of the core area. So thanks for that, Kate. Um, there's another question. Can you speak more about the details of the legacy zoning for the core? How are you sure that this is adequate to deal with future zoning issues? So that's an excellent question, Connie. Um, one of the interesting things about the study when we started was uh, legacy zoning is usually one of the approaches we would look at in um, implementing um, a planning framework for an area with such unique character. In the case of Grimsby Beach, it was actually already in place. What wasn't in place are the planning policies and guidelines uh, that are needed to ensure that as change comes forward and people are seeking to, to change that existing zoning, 
to ensure that that's undertaken in a way that uh, appropriate policies and guidelines are in place to assess that change. And so um, legacy zoning in essence says that if you have an existing home on your lot, uh, you can replace that home so long as it is within what I'll call the current building footprint where the current um, home is located. You also have the opportunity to increase the size of that home by up to 15%. So, you know, an addition, uh, uh, maybe it's a small second story addition, uh, but you have to do so um, through the site plan process. And so the legacy zoning gives some, some opportunity for some change, uh, but it is somewhat uh, restricted through the zoning. Um, what was not clear is if there is a vacant uh, lot, how that legacy zoning applies, because in essence, there are no existing setbacks, either front yard or rear yard or, or side yard, and there is no established coverage or, or floor area. So what we have added to uh, what I'll call the legacy zoning is a provision to control the coverage on any uh, a vacant lot to up to 25%, um, which in some cases is is a little bit uh, more than, than what might be in place, but in many cases it's it's a control to ensure that there is some compatibility um, with any new uh, development within the area. Uh, the one thing I also mentioned in the presentation in addition to uh, the zoning is the consideration for something called a deeming bylaw, which has occurred in Grimsby Beach on a, a number of occasions. And that is where some of the older um, pl uh, registered plans from many, many decades ago um, have resulted in some some smaller lots uh, across which a uh, home is, is developed and, and the parcel fabric is not reflective of those original plans. So the deeming bylaw is a way in which to be more reflective of the actual um, lots and lotting patterns. So that's something that we have recommended in, in our uh, report and something that's being put forward to be further considered um, by the town and, and by council when uh, the documents move forward. Um, the last question I have here uh, in the uh, Q&A is, again, anonymous. Uh, the land use study proposal does not indicate protection of existing cottages, but it lays the foundation for new homes in historic Grimsby Beach. It actually recommends new homes not be similar designs. Can you speak to this? So I think that the, and I certainly can, and staff can can add to this. Um, I, th I think that the, the challenge here and the concern here is what policy actually does. Um, so the, the 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 challenge here is that the um, planning framework is required to implement provincial and regional policies as well as reflect the policies in the parent plan. And and so what it speaks to is the way in which change is is assessed. And we're also required to identify what that change is. So um, it's important to know that that we're not advocating for everyone to replace their homes. Um, we're not advocating that uh, they not be similar. Um, those are all things that can be considered based on individual choice and preference. What we're putting in place is, is a policy framework to say that when and if this change occurs, and we believe it, it will occur through uh, replacement homes, and it may occur through infill on vacant lots, uh, it may occur where uh, the regulations allow through secondary suites, we're setting out policies that will identify how that change um, can occur and, and what is required to be considered for any application for such change. So I, I, I think it's important to note that we're not necessarily um, advocating for, for all of this growth to occur. In fact, it's quite the opposite. We're identifying that based on the assessment in our study that the, the growth we know will be limited and where and if it does occur, we're setting out uh, what we believe is an appropriate policy framework by identifying these character areas, by setting out additional specific policies that have to be assessed if and when those changes um, are occurring. Um, so I hope that helps to just kind of convey that it's it's not intended to open things up uh, for uh, development. It's intended to really provide um, a concise uh, framed policy framework uh, within which those changes uh, may be considered. 
Um, Dorothy, excellent question. I believe that absolutely is a typo. It should say maximum coverage. Um, and I'm just double checking because that's definitely what the bylaw provides for. So we'll we'll certainly make that that correction uh, in the planning report. Dana, there's a few questions in the chat as well that, um, sure. that have come up. Um, the first one is from Mark. How has the report addressed services upgrades such as sewers? And um, I, I think there's um, some complementary um, uh, materials that uh, uh, go with the secondary plan and zoning bylaw as well that uh, speak to additional infrastructure and um, servicing that um, are, are, are complement the, the study as well. And there's also some policies within the secondary plan um, that talk about servicing when um, new development is proposed as well. I'm not sure if there's anything else that you want to add. Yeah, no, absolutely, Terry. Um, there are a series of recommendations in the in the planning report under the servicing section uh, that speak to um, uh, a number of upgrades uh, that would be uh, that should be considered to the town's updates in the area. Um, and there are also a number um, of um, upgrades as they relate to stormwater management. So those are set out in detail in the planning report under that section. And then there are appendices to that report that were completed by Crozier with all of the background information. Um, and those specific upgrades are identified actually on the um, on the draft infrastructure plan. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I can't speak to those in, in detail, but I'm happy to have uh, those questions answered uh, offline in detail uh, through staff. Oh, um, sorry, there's another comment here that, and there's some more questions in chat, but um, apparently Nicole has a raised hand. Bianca, do you oh. want to I will ask, ask Bianca to... I see it now. Oh, I, I apologize. I can't see the, the raised hand, so... Oh, yes, I can. <laughs> It's gone on my screen now. No, I can't. Yeah. <laughs> so Nicole, if, oh, there we go. Oh, nope. it keeps bouncing. Okay, let me see if I can find her name here. Hi, Nicole, can you hear me? Hi, can you hear me? I can. Okay, great. Um, so I read the, um, the design guidelines um, from front to back and that, you know, I appreciate the amount of work that went into this. Um, however, I found it a little bit confusing, um, specifically um, when it came to um, the whimsical features um, of these houses. I mean, let's face it, this is what uh, attracts all of the uh, tourists. Um, and admittedly, when I first moved to the community, uh, it wasn't really my cup of tea, but upon reflection, um, I've really come to appreciate that this is an art form and uh, this is something really different from anywhere in the world. I mean, I actually uh, did a search for colorful homes around the world and there's at least 50 cities that have those bright uh, colors that are so prevalent um, in Grimsby Beach. But nowhere do you see um, Cadillac fences, giant sunflowers, uh, you don't see magic mushrooms, um, and all of these great creative things like Popeye and Ollie. Um, and, you know, it, that would be a shame to lose. And I understand that in the report, they're saying, okay, well, you know, we're not telling you what colors um, to paint your houses, but there's no um, notation about that. And in fact, there, I think there was something that decoration uh, should be able to be removed. And there seems to be these competing um, sort of uh, points of reference with heritage um, and, and, and this art form, which is seemingly ignored. Um, and then the other point is that, um, you know, are you planning on just saying that it's legally non-conforming where it is and that anybody else who wants to do this, um, they can't because they're going to be um, restricted by the Heritage Committee? And then one last question is that um, what type of extra costs are the residents going to incur um, because of this next or this additional step um, with the, uh, the Heritage Committee? in terms of approvals and such. 
And I have a ton of other questions, but I'll leave it. Yeah. At so, yeah. so thanks, Nicole. Maybe, maybe I can speak to, I think the, the first question that you raised in relation to some of what I'll call, um, you know, that the, the recent sort of um, vibrancy and some of the, the uh, renovations and features that, you know, the gingerbread trim and the colors and the decorations. I, I, I don't think there's any question that those definitely define some of the uniqueness of the area. There's, there's, there's no question. I'm, you just, all you need to do is, is Google Grimsby beach and all of those photos we've used them in our report. I, I, I think they're an incredible reflection of the uniqueness of the area. I think we're just trying to ensure that we're not, um, overly prescribing anything of that nature and, and basically saying that it should just be carefully considered um, that we don't want to create any kind of falsification um, in the area because there, there are a number of properties under the Heritage Act that would be listed or designated that might not exhibit those particular characteristics and, and not to say that they couldn't proceed with some of those those changes, but it's really trying to you know, determine what the the historic heritage structures and features are and should be um, reflected in the in the document. So that's probably why you don't see sort of something very specific to some of the the recent changes in colors. Um, but it's not intended to in any way detract from that or um, take away from that. It's it's really to suggest, and we actually made quite a few changes based on the comments we received on the heritage guidelines um, through both the TAC and the community to make sure that we're not, you know, discouraging. Uh, we're basically intending to um, reflect that that is unique, but to also understand the, the cultural heritage um, attributes. So I'm not sure that answers your question. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take those comments. And I think as was noted earlier on, the intention is to ensure that we receive all of these comments and if there are revisions and updates to language that you know may be seen as something that we need to reconsider and change through the public comment we definitely want to make sure we capture that so i do appreciate the comment you're not the first community member to come back and and convey that comment back to us so we will definitely take that and make sure that those guidelines are reflective of, of sort of the community's desire to reflect the importance of, of those um, newer features. And I'm sorry, but, the second question you had was about cost. So I would, um, and process, so I, I put that over to the, perhaps to the staff to respond. Uh, thanks, Dana. Just to speak to the uh, heritage permits, we do not charge for heritage permits. So there's no financial impact from those. Oh, okay. Well, that's good to know. So, the, so you're not going to charge for it to like if you say that it has to go through the uh, heritage board. So, back to the first question: Are you actually saying that heritage attributes uh, come first and foremost versus like all of these great decorative elements and crazy colors? Um, is that what we're trying to do? Well, the, um, the the Heritage Act is very specific about defining cultural heritage attributes for. Mm -hmm designated and listed properties. Um, and again, I, I'm, I'm not aware that those are, are reflected in the designations because they wouldn't have been the original um, features or colors. They've sort of been revised and, and, and expanded on from, from our research sort of, I believe it's like the 1970s, 1980s um, with a number of, of re sort of renovations that actually opened up what were previously enclosed porches. And so I think we're just being very cautious about the extent to which those are being um, reflected as, as part of the listings and the, and the designations, noting that they are there, they are unique, but under the Heritage Act, there's a very specific definition of um, the research that's done to identify those cultural heritage features. Okay, so if I understand you correctly, then it's not a priority. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, um, <laughs> Dana, I'm not sure that's what I said, but that's okay. But but I, I just like it just to me personally, like, like I said, I would never do it to my house because it's not my personal taste. But yeah. that is just what makes this community so special is that creativity. 
yep. and that liberty that people have applied. And I'm not sure that gingerbread cuts it. Um, it's it's all the other crazy whimsical things that they're yeah, doing. Yeah, and I and 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 I don't think we disagree. I think that the heritage guidelines are very specific to the heritage attributes. And if mm -hmm. I can just take all of the great things you're speaking to that we agree with, those are identified as unique characteristics and no one is suggesting that they're not something that should be continued or a priority. It's just under those specific heritage guidelines, they need to reflect what's described under the Heritage Act. Okay, thank you. Okay, going back to the, um, the questions in the chat, there's one from S. Porter that says, what is the actual density of just the core area alone? And is that section considered low density? Um, I, I can answer that. The, um, it is considered low density in the official plan. It's, it, I'm not sure if I remember the specific um, density figure, but it, it is definitely considered low density in the official plan just as a general policy. So that would be why it's called that. Um, and then it says, will secondary suites include detached units? It doesn't now according to what is in the town zoning but it might be amended in the future to include exterior secondary suites. As Dania mentioned, um, the, one of the provincial policies is to allow for um, secondary suites. And that is something that the town is going to have to look at um, to make sure that we are complying with um, those requirements. So we would definitely consider that, but as the policies have not even been drafted or, or considered, or we haven't gotten any feedback, we, I don't think we can fully answer that right now. Like, there, we might put some exclusions in there recognizing that, yeah, it's already tight <laughs> um, on some of those slots, so that might not be appropriate. Um, and I don't think I see any other questions in the chat right now. So maybe while we're waiting for that, maybe, I don't know, Terry or Bianca, um, if you can provide in the chat, maybe a link to where people can also provide additional comments um, on the secondary plan, the zoning, but also on the other implementation documents, um, that might be helpful. I can try and do it in the interim, but I think a number of good questions have come up. And I think if, if you know, we're catch, capturing them here, but after the webinar closes, um, if everyone has access to that link, if we can throw it in the chat, and if people have questions or comments after, it would be great to get those um, onto, uh, onto the, um, the Let's Talk page. And that could be also by providing those to staff as well through email. So I wasn't, wasn't quite sure. Um, exactly, Dana. So I'm just gonna put my email in the chat and then if anyone has anything, they can send it over to me. We have a new question in the chat from Nicole. Climate change is such a serious issue. Why the restrictions on solar panels? And related to that, also garages for e-vehicles. Everyone will eventually need. So I, I know the issue with um, accessory structures and solar panels came up and I I know that there was, was actually a revision made to the, the guidelines in, in that respect. Um, and I, I'm not sure that they're restricted. I have to, I'll have to pull that section and Nicole, I will do that and make sure we respond to that. Um, I just, I, I do know that that specifically came up and the same I think would apply to, to garages. Um, again, where garages can be accommodated um, on a lot uh, where they, perhaps exist today or where someone wanted to add one. Um, there are a number of considerations for garages and th those provisions are set out in the town's bylaw. So, so certainly um, if they can be accommodated within the required zoning provisions, um, they would be provided for. And, and I know where they don't uh, exist today, there's you know some guidance to maintain those existing areas, but certainly it's not precluding that as long as it would meet the, the zoning provisions in terms of the size, location, and, and probably the height.
Dana, there's another question in the um, question and answer, and you might be best able to answer that one. Sorry. Okay. Um, your map, which shows access points to the core area, seems to neglect that much of the traffic is through Victoria Terrace Park as people park on Tupper and Park North and enter the area through the path in the park, which then directs the foot traffic south into Bell Park. The other main entry point is also along Temple. Um, from those who park on Bell, did the report study the actual foot traffic patterns? I think to some extent um, those were identified in terms of, of general circulation, um, but the report, the traffic report didn't specifically look at, at foot traffic patterns. One of the things I know that um, we have recommended, again, related to that public realm master plan is to specifically address pedestrian connectivity. And that would include considering what the existing routes are um, for pedestrian circulation uh, throughout the, the community and where in fact, some of those areas are not accessible or impeded with the idea of making sure that those are enhanced and that there is appropriate and safe um, connections through the area. So it, it is certainly something that, that needs to be further addressed specifically as it relates to foot traffic, um, but it wasn't specifically addressed other than you know, general active transportation routes, which are along the right of ways uh, in the area and some of those connections, but foot traffic itself was, was, not, was not measured, just where those existing connections are. And we have another question in the chat that says, I noticed that some of the ages of the homes are incorrect on the map. Can that be checked further? Um, yes, absolutely. If um, we're utilizing the town's uh, building permit data, so um, we can double check that and, and uh, circle back on that. Sorry, I did just, I, find, I found the solar panel reference and I think it said that they may be added, but they're encouraged to be located on the slopes of the roof, which may be sited away. So I know originally in the report, um, we had had a more of a restrictive approach to that and that was changed to accommodate uh, the ability to provide for solar panels. Oh, I just saw a great question from Connie. It says, uh, would you mind to identify where in the report the protection of views is discussed? Um, I'm interested in the protection of views for people with accessibility issues, especially this summer. I noticed a large number of people in wheelchairs uh, needing to enjoy the views from the terrace footpath. So I can certainly, um, I'll type that answer in for you, Connie. There are um, a number of sections in the report and even in the secondary plan. So maybe while we're um, online, I, I can type those in, in for you. There's also a schedule that um, includes arrows that, that you might want to look at. Yeah. Um, Cody, if you haven't seen that, it, it definitely shows where the views are, are going to that, that, you're looking, that were discussed. Well, Dana's looking for that. Did anybody else have any other questions that they had about the study of the secondary plan zoning, any of the materials? Um, from Dorothy, 
on protection of views as well. Why was the view looking at Victoria Ter Terrace from Lake Ontario not considered as this was the initial vantage point for those arriving by boat ship to the dock? It was very prevalent in the historical pictures. Sorry, well, I, Yeah, I was just gonna say, I, I think the panoramic view from that location is provided. I'm just trying to find the, the reference. So that would be the view from Victoria Terrace um, to the lake. So I believe there's three areas that are identified, but I think what would help probably um, as Nicole has noted is extending those arrows. So it shows that they're you know not from the water out, but actually from Victoria Terrace. The, the one arrow would probably be beneficial to extend that. So we can definitely look at that. Sorry. I have to take myself off mute. Um, <laughs> there's another comment in the chat. Um, the reports anticipated that the majority of this change and new development will occur in the west and south character areas, but there are specific vacant lots, um, new units and secondary suite located in the core area. If so, where? And where are the potential minor lot divisions and lot consolidations located? That was in the chat, correct? Yes. Yeah. So, um, in terms of the the vacant lots, um, those are obviously identified. Um, I think there's a, a number of, of of maps that illustrate the existing dwellings and those areas where there are um, vacant lots, uh, which would allow for infill. Um, and so I can, I, again, I'll reference that particular figure in the, in the planning report. Um, and then based on our assessment, we've identified the num number of those that are, are existing. Um, again, in terms of the potential for minor lot divisions and lot consolidations, we haven't identified um, specific locations for those uh, because they could be framed in a number of different, different ways. Um, so we haven't specifically identified where lot uh, creation or consolidation would occur. We've just identified based on the historical trends um, that change that has occurred over, um, I believe it's the period that set out in the planning report in terms of previous consent applications and, and uh, previous infill applications. So we haven't set those out, um, but again, we've provided a framework when and if such a change uh, may come forward would be um, now established or assessed through the established framework. So I, I will look um, and add in the chat the reference to the um, uh, the lot fabric that illustrates where those those vacant lots are. Okay, so we have some further comments about the views. Um, so, um, okay, Kate added, did Dorothy mean the view from the shore to the terrace opposite direction of arrows? So I think um, that Dana an did answer that, that we, we will definitely look and, and make sure that those uh, arrows are captured um, when, when we're, provide, we're updating the documents. And, um, Dorothy has another question. Um, I did not see any input from Indigenous community group stakeholders as part of the engagement process noted in the RFP, which Indigenous groups were consulted and what were their recommendations? Bianca, I think you reached out. Did you want to talk to that? Uh, thanks, Terry. Um, so we actually uh, received the um, list of Indigenous groups um, within the Niagara region. Um, from um, a representative from the region. And uh, we've reached out to these individuals and we've been corresponding back and forth 
Um, we haven't received any significant uh, comments at this point, um, but we continue to consult with them. So that's very much still underway. And again, those comments will be um, implemented. Were there any other questions or, or comments that people would like to ask this time? Oh, wait. Um, okay, there's an anonymous attendee. Um, I'm wondering when the town will address some of the setback and public realm issues that you talked about in the core area. For example, sometimes um, the homes are built right on, at the lot line or even over the lot line. In some cases, fences have been built or sheds put up, decks, etc. on what is public land. I am not sure we should allow people to rebuild right on the same footprint when we can take the opportunity to correct this issue by requiring three feet from the lot line as required as in the existing bylaws. When considering building plans, related to this, new builds built on or close to the property line can result in damage on the adjacent property. If new builds are allowed to build right on the lot line, we are perpetuating existing issues. That's in the Q&A, Dana. Um, I think um, Dana talked a bit about some of the, the deeming bylaws that we have and, and some of the um, the zoning that is, is currently in place, especially for the Grimsby Beach core area with regard to the, the current um, setbacks. But um, yeah. and the, also the public realm plan that you were talking about, but yeah. I'm not sure if you had anything else that you wanted to talk about. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think this is certainly an issue which was raised very early in the study. And I mentioned it at the beginning that there's a couple of layers to it. There's, you know, the, the recognition of the areas that are actually publicly accessible or through easements or where encroachments have been granted. And um, that's quite complex <laughs> throughout Grimsby Beach. So that does need to be further addressed to identify where those public areas um, are located and where in fact they can be enhanced. That's part of that public realm uh, master plan that should be developed and implemented as we've recommended. And that would address those concerns around fences and decks and sheds and and also in the future um, for individuals who might be seeking for uh, some accommodation for those um, features and structures um, adjacent to their lots as well. So it's very clear um, sort of the status. Um, the second thing as it relates to the question on, you know, existing lots, that's certainly definitely something that's, again, as I mentioned early, something that's conveyed throughout the reports and in the secondary plan and in the zoning and that is to identify that there is change that will occur and how that change will occur on lots going forward would be assessed within the new po policy framework and regulatory framework with the updates to the bylaw but also there's um, the need to consider the deeming bylaw to be more reflective so that the lot fabric as it exists today is more reflective um, of, of the existing area. So it's a multi-pronged approach. Um, and again, uh, that's what the study um, and the implementing documents is, is seeking to do is, is to address those issues through, through various tools. Um, so it is, it is complex, but appreciate the question because we know that there, are, there were a number of concerns and issues about some of the current um, uh, encroachments and, and constraints in the area. So thank you for that question. There was a, the additional question in um, questions and answers. Should these issues not be covered in the zoning bylaw as restrictions rather than public realm, which is only a policy and not enforceable? 
Yeah, so so good good question. The zoning bylaw can address uh, the regulation of our use of, uh, sorry, buildings and structures under the Planning Act. Um, in terms of the public realm and the zoning of that public realm, um, that's a different question um, and not easily regulated through zoning. Um, but certainly on private property, again, if it's existing as of um, the date of the zoning bill as it's set out, and again, as reflected through the, the legacy zoning, um, that continues to be carried forward. Um, so there are some ways through zoning that we are addressing some of those issues, but certainly in the in the public realm, it's a it's a different approach. So as I mentioned, it's it's not just one way in which to address these concerns. Yes, you're right. Some can be addressed through zoning, um, but others need to be addressed through those those other tools that we mentioned. there's an additional question with respect to the Indigenous consultation and maybe that's probably something really important for um, to, for staff in the um, report going as part of the public meeting to identify how um, that consultation has taken place and, and what those comments have been and how they've been addressed. Hi Dan, I just wanted to add um, so these were the um, Indigenous groups identified by the region as being um, notable within this area. So I, I do have a list. I believe there was uh, nine different groups that were selected. So happy to include some more details on which groups were selected. And uh, to this point, uh, we've either received um, no comments um, in relation to specific documents, a part of this study, um, and they have asked to be a, a part of other things. Um, and that was, um, that's still something that's being regulated by the region, the things they were interested in. Um, and then some of the other groups asked for um, additional compensation for meaningful um, comments. So those are the majority of comments we've received to the state, nothing really specific to the study. It's more uh, general, so thank you. Okay. Thanks. So I am cautious of um, time. I know we scheduled an hour and we're well into an hour and a half. So maybe happy to take a few more minutes. Um, and then I think um, we'll close off the, the webinar for tonight. But I, I did wanna say um, thank you to everyone for very detailed questions. Um, there's a lot of information, a lot to be considered. Um, and I think the important thing is that we hear those comments from the community. Um, we have um, some time to respond to those and, and follow up and provide that additional information and response. Um, and if any questions weren't answered tonight or, or you'd like additional information, please again, reach out to Bianca through the email that was provided in the chat to again, provide those additional comments, ask those questions um, so that we have those prior to the uh, to the next meeting and certainly going forward. Um, I think as, as Antonetta mentioned and Terry mentioned, um, there's lots of opportunities for continued engagement on the implementation documents. So that would include the heritage, um, the urban design and heritage guidelines, as well as the, um, the tree strategy um, and the focus being on the sort of the secondary plan and the zoning for the next meeting, but, but certainly not to preclude comments on, on those other documents as we go forward. But those other documents will be subject to more review and, and circulation and comment um, through additional process. And the town will be setting that out um, at the next meeting. So thanks, Bianca. I think just put in the link to all the information and certainly her email and contact information is there as well. So with that, maybe I'll uh, again thank everyone, but just pass it over to Antonetta for any concluding uh, remarks. And um, again, thank you everyone um, for attending this evening. I really appreciate your time.
Thanks, Dana. Uh, uh, Dana, I'll just echo what you said. Thank you to the MHBC team, to the staff who have worked diligently on this, and most of all, to all the community members who have helped us shape and bring forward this document. And we look forward to your continued participation. Please do check out the Let's Talk Grimsby page. Uh, in a few days, we'll have the uh, presentation and video posted up there as well. And there'll be um, all the information that you might need, including contact information for staff is also on that page. So thanks again and have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thanks everyone. Thank you.